यहाँ एकत्र हुए हैं श्रीमान राजीव जी मल्होत्रा का उद्बोधन सुनने के लिए उद्बोधन का हमने आज विषय रखा है क्राइसिस ऑफ हिंदू सिविलाइजेशन हिंदू सभ्यता का संकट आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट आर स्पीकर श्री राजीव मल्होत्रा जी प्लीज कम एंड गिव इज एड्रेस नमस्ते I am indeed delighted to be here in the presence of, especially, Dr. Muni Manohar Joshi ji and Kapil Kapoor ji and India Policy Foundation leaders who are who come up with a very interesting topic. The first word, crisis, I think is very important. Usually we are celebrating how great, great we are. There is no problem. We are all in feeling very good. And the word crisis is very important, but not often discussed. The crisis is not blaming others of past history, but we have to also take stock of ourselves here and now today. And this is not being done enough. So I think one of the probably the first crisis is not enough introspection with a critical view, an objective view. I'm indeed honored that Dr. Muli Bhunoji is here because I've known him, we've known each other for a long time and followed his work and he's probably the most eminent and important contemporary thinker of our civilization who is able to put it in the context of modern science, modern modernity in general, connect the past with the present and the future. So in fact, I should be sitting and listening and watching uh, to him giving his talk. But uh, since, since uh, I've been asked to do so, I will, I will uh, present my thoughts. <coughs> the crisis that I want to talk about is the internal crisis. Are we too complacent? Are we more interested in feel good? In fact, I, I find that uh, very often when I raise challenges to the youth, they say, sir, aapne hamara feel good kar kar diya. We are feeling good, sir. So they want some kind of a nasha. Ki hum bohat great hain, great the, how great we were, how bad everybody is. You know, as if Sanya Vajakar, you can go home after saying all that and the job is done. But you know, there is a ground reality we have to take stock of. I also see that there's a tendency to do what I call micro-optimization, which means me, mine, here and now. You might call it Jugaad. So when you go and raise an issue with somebody, he will say, Sir, what is your problem? Aap aaj hai. He will fix your problem. But that doesn't change the system. That doesn't change. It's not an end-to-end -end systemic solution. There's a certain issue I will discuss why we often tend to drift into Chukar. Now, there are two extremes our people tend to go into. Either over-abstraction or too narrowly defining the situation and getting away with Chukar. Over-abstraction is that this is a myth. That is going really over abstraction. Talk about some very lofty shloka about Paramartika and not address the Vivarika current situation I'm facing. This is a very common thing, a kind of an escape into otherworldliness. I told a relative of mine, you know, this your foot down is very good. And her answer is, sir, Raji, why you sub to name everywhere? It's like that. So either the problem is everywhere, or the problem is inevitable, or it's the government's job, or there is no problem, but somehow or other the bottom line is that we have to do So this kind of an escape, either over abstracting and generalizing a problem, so it's so general, you are looking at the problem from Mars or from another galaxy, so far such a broad view that you know you really can't actually do anything practical. Either that extreme or the other extreme of 
things will change because we'll get some force multiplier, we'll get some leverage, because we thought all these issues will, the, the state of Hindu civilization will get a big jump with a change in the government. But what I found is, there is a, I would say there is a deep distinction we have to make between Rashtra and Rajya. Rashtra and Rajya. And a whole lot of activity is going into Rajya. Who will form this government? Who will topple that government? What is this coalition? Who gets this FIR? Who is the bad fellow? Who is corrupt? This is all a kind of a tamasha at the Rajya level. I know it is important. It is very good to have a nice government and we have a very good government. Much better than any other in the past. But that is at the Rajya level. And we can deplete our pran and feel very happy at the winning, at the victories at the Rajya level. But what about the Rashtra? Who is looking after the Rashtra? That is my concern. The Hindu civilization, the Vedic civilization is a Rashtra issue, not addressed by just switching from one Rajya to another. A good Rajya is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. You do need a good Rajya, but just by having a good Rajya, you can't assume that job is done. So the problems I am concerned about are Rashtra problems. The Rajya has so much authority, control over the institutional machinery. They have resources. They can decide what the education curriculum will be. They have a, the, the most important uh, organs for for my work are HRD, Ministry of Culture, and IC, ICCR, which is part of the Ministry of External Affairs. And I've gone around here and there to all of them, but I do not see either the vision, the strategy, the commitment, the leadership, at least from my point of view, maybe there are great things happening, but I, I, I'll give you one or two examples. The ICSSR, Indian Council of Social Science Research, gives so much, so many grants. Since the leftist days, they've been, the leftists were giving grants to so many institutions, CSDS in Delhi, for example, and many others all over the country. Now, I have tried to uh, create projects where we will introduce the Vedic ideas of sociology. Sociology as a discipline is a Western discipline. It started in a very big way in the 1800s, somewhat before also, but in a big way in the 1800s, from Europe, addressing their needs. It is hardly, they, those needs of Europe are hardly universal needs. The solutions are not universal solutions. All the great thinkers being taught in sociology, and I've looked at the school curriculum, I've looked at the UPSC curriculum, I've looked at the college curriculums, in sociology, anthropology, these kind of disciplines, these the great thinkers they talk about are all Western names. And if you make a list of these Western names and you go to any Sanskrit scholar, any traditional person, he will not know what you are talking about. So basically, our society is being studied through alien lens. That the, and our traditional adhikaris don't even know what is this going on. So to people say, "Acha, kuch karenge." So every proposal I gave, and I stopped giving proposals now, every proposal I gave, I was told that, when, that you have to comply with the requirements of social sciences. So now I have to fit into the opposing sides framework. Jinko mein dumana chata hoon, jinko girana chata hoon, jinko criticize karna chata hoon, I have to first of all comply with their requirements. This means that I have to distort my own thinking, I have to study, I have to fit into them become one of them, in order that my proposal be considered legitimate. 
because they will say that your methodology is, you have to fit into social sciences methodology. But the social sciences methodology is itself my problem. So why do I want to fit here? So, so and I found that the the people making these decisions, while they are very good Hindus, they will talk nicely and all that, but they really lack the, the depth, the wisdom, the courage, the risk taking to say, okay, we know one of the things we should do is evaluate our own methodology. So I said your methodology for selecting uh, you know grants and giving you know for scholars and whatnot different projects in ICSSR that itself should be subject to review. I would like to do that. So this takes thinking out of the box. You see, one of the problems we have is not being risk taking where risk is required. You cannot make fundamental change without controversy. You cannot. I mean, if you want to topple a government, it's controversial. If you want to topple Newtonian physics with relativity, that's controversial. If you want to topple mainstream with you know, so the, uh, cloud computing, that's controversial. Any technological breakthrough, any political breakthrough, any physics, ideological, any kind of breakthrough requires controversy because the incumbents don't like to be toppled. They are they're sitting in a comfort zone and they don't like to be toppled. So either you are a conformist or if you are a radical thinker, which is what we need right now, then you know you are controversial. So Adi Shankara was very controversial in this time. Buddha was very controversial in this time. Jesus Christ was so controversial that the rulers killed him because he's so controversial. So how can we become so numb and uh, you know uh, unwilling to appreciate uh, provocative thinking? This is this is a crisis. It's a crisis of our civilization that the civilization built on radical thinking. If you look at the insights. In the Upanishads, if you look at the insights, the dialogues in the Mahabharata, they are so provocative that how can the people who are the inheritors of such a great civilization be just very complacent that Yasi Chaltar has said, this is how it is, Yasi Chaltar. Now, let's, let's take a, a prominent thinker. I give this as an example. Divya Lupal. I studied his words. He gave, he gave these four famous lectures on integral humanism. And everybody, whenever I say, okay, what is your ideology? What is your thought? What is your theory today? What is your school of thought? And say, Dindya Lopadhyaya. But that is half a century ago. Dindya Lopadhyaya, in those lectures, starts off by criticizing both the Congress party and his own party for not bringing fresh thought, for not addressing the situation in the latest context. He says we are baat kar rahe hai, but we should talk about today's context and he's very critical. So in, by the same token, I have to be critical that we have not updated these Diyan Apathya's thoughts for today. We, there, we haven't created a school of thought and a curriculum where that line of thinking continues for today. So many things have happened in the last 50 years. For instance, he, you know, he criticizes Marxism and uh, Christian evangelism, which were prevalent then. But at, uh, during his time, there was no post-colonial studies. It came later. There was no subaltern studies, postmodernism, neo-orientalism, neo all these new thoughts, this new feminism, these new human rights things, these things didn't exist. So the, the, the new weapons and schools of thought of the opposing side, we have to understand them, look for the paksha and respond to them. We cannot say that Shankara ne Purav Paksha kya ta, wo hamne memorize kiya, we re-enact the old Purav Paksha, that is not being true to the tradition. That's like saying we don't need batsmen who can score because the Nurkar ne bana di di century, ek baar bana di di century, uske baare mein hum baat karenge to kaam ban jayega. You have to do it today. So where is the, where is the Indian schools of, schools of thought? Relevant for today, updated for today, giving case studies with today's example and today's challenges. You know, whether it is water harvesting or global uh, you know, warming or terrorism or whatever it you take, we have to be able to apply not some social sciences theories from the imported countries, uh, foreign countries, but our own, you know, we have to produce dissertations and we have to produce applications of our thought. That is what Smriti is about. You're supposed to update Smriti. You know, rather than memorizing the Smriti, you have to update the Smriti for each era. So this is where I feel that we have uh, fallen short in the sense that uh, we are not creating original thinking 
out of the box provocative thinking and, and it, 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 this is not like a religion where it is a fixed one book memorize karo dogma hai obey blind obedience those kind of religions can survive without uh, such th thinking because uh, that is their nature and that is how they are, are but for us to survive we need vibrant intellectuals we absolutely need vibrant intellectuals and this is my my concern today now there is a yogi civilization and there is a gladiator civilization the gladiator is a term from the romans uh, military danda top down rule top lot of police power that is gladiator civilization western civilization is actually roman the romans romans conquered greek greece in the you know 140 45 46 bc Uh, and they and brought in the whole greek civilization under their control and then the christianity which was originated south of the mediterranean was also taken over by the romans who are not of the mediterranean so the semitic christianity is actually in asia if you look at the map it is in asia where asia and africa meet and it is not european in origin so the romans took that over and the emperor constantine roman emperor constantine in the 4th century he creates what is called the new testament the new testament in a town called nicaea i went there it is now in turkey i went and saw the cathedral where they actually did all this so the romans conquered and assimilated the greek civilization and the christian thought and created what became known as the west so this roman ethos of the gladiator is very deeply enshrined in western thought that is why the west is so good at institutions multinationals the romans and then the vatican initiate which is a, a launch a, a, a kind of a, a, you know multinational started by the romans these became the first major multinationals of the world and all the others are like eastern they come from model after that how you have governing body how you have you know all these kind of rules how you remote manage you appoint governors what not that whole uh, approach of the of the modern corporate and the modern governance in the west is based on the roman style now this is what i call the gladiator civilization uh, it has lot of amazing things about it they have been very very successful and this is top down the ethos is top down contrasting with this is the yogi civilization the yogi civilization is that you do not need that much policing because each citizen is a yogi and he has a dharma and he is sattvic and he is concerned about other people he is voluntarily doing things because you don't have to push him into it you don't have to do danda to make him do things he wants to do it because that is his tapasya so he is doing his swadharma so if you have a community of yogis you do not need much policing This is very interesting. You you have a different way of organizing the group and getting group dynamics and group performance without top-down heavy-handed stuff. Now we are that kind of civilization, and the West is a different kind of civilization. I would submit to you that the crisis we have is that today we are neither. We are neither good yogis nor have we achieved the institutional power. we do not have a, 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 you know people complying conforming to a real true swadharma from within living that life because people are opportunists people are corrupt people are looking for selfish goals people are materialistic so the yogi fabric of civilization has fallen apart and there is a history of it for a thousand years why how it has broken our universities destroyed the paramparas destroyed so there is a history for it it's not the fault of anybody today but we have to take stock of this fact that our historical strength as a yogi civilization where the fabric of society was such that individuals self empowered self actualized could do great things collectively without a central authority forcing them in fact this goes back to the 
Harappan Saraswati Indian civilization, where there is no major capital. So there is no in the if you look at the archaeology of the Indus Saraswati Harappan, there are just 2,000 small towns. It's a lot of small towns, but there is no very big palace fortress that would be the center of power. Nothing looks like any headquarter over. Yahan se, uh, the military power will be. There's nothing like that. So it means as far back as we can remember. We have been a very decentralized civilization. And decentralized means that a lot, everyone at every level, far away also, has a lot of autonomy. But that means you must be a responsible person. If you give a lot of freedom and a lot of autonomy to people who are irresponsible, who are corrupt, who are selfish, then you will have a complete lawlessness and you will have chaos and problems. And we are having that. Because our traditional civilizational system, tha, that has been broken and a new, we are not, we are not neither westernized nor are we proper Vedic. We are neither here nor there. And, the, and you see, so many attempts are being made to westernize us and destroy our civilization. For example, it has been considered foolishly that to be educated means writing rather than the oral tradition. This is considered. It is considered foolishly that this measure of education is how much English you know. This is a very sad thing. You know, so the benchmarks, the criteria of what makes a nation has become very westernized. West American Sanjay. And then we have the power of Western institutional authority. Then we need the same kind of, you know, the United States has got very powerful institutions. I lived there for almost 40, 50, for almost 50 years now. I can tell you that the institutions are remarkable. The president could be anything, the Congress could be anything, there can be all problems, scandals, but there are institutions that keep it running. And these institutions are very robust. Now, for us to, it will take a very long time if you want to do that. But then we will not be a Vedic civilization. You see, you have to understand that. You have to realize, you have to decide do we want to go, do we want to be true to who we are and then become modern based on our own foundation? Or do we want to abandon that because we think that is no good and try to become westernized, Americanized, and so on? So many youths today judge their success and their criteria based on how Americanized they are. This is true here. You see. Very little knowledge and very little confidence and interest in the traditional ways. A good example of balance is China. China has decided that their traditional civilization is Confucian. Confucius was their great thinker. So Confucian thought is sort of like saying Vedic civilization. And they are very clear that Confucian thought is not anti-modernity, it is not anti-post-modernity. They believe that Confucian thought gives them a foundation on which they have modernity, post-modernity. They are going to be the most modern country, the most scientific country, the most industrialized country. In material terms, they will be the most powerful country and yet they will not lose character as a Confucian country. And something similar Japanese achieved on a smaller scale than China, where they did not lose their tradition, but they became the most economic power in terms of uh, technology, science, all that stuff. They did not think that you have to make a choice between tradition and modern. They said we have we have modernity according to our own way of achieving modernity. So just like there is a Western universalism, which means West says we are the universal people, and our views and our theories are universal, and our science and all that we are using, we are putting it on top of our own ancient ideas of who we are, back since Roman times and so on, and even before. Just like the West has built so many strata, so many levels on top of their old civilization, and China is doing it, Japan has done it, the real Vedic civilization has to be modern, postmodern, you know, materialistic also, military also, all of economic prosperity, all of that you have to do on top of a Vedic platform. This is the Vedic universalism. We have to create Vedic exceptionalism. Like in America, they say their grand narrative is called American, American exceptionalism. Every school child knows what is meant by American exception. He is required to know everybody, every American knows. You could be Democrat, Republican, you are American exception. That, that is not negotiable. So we don't have a 
kind of a consensus of a grand narrative of Vedic exceptions, which is required. The, the, the people who are promoting Vedas often go into such orthodoxy and, and dislike for the modernity and modern technology and not really engaging modern issues they need to. That is that they are not making the Vedic civilization relevant. They are making it kind of irrelevant and, and they are sort of, uh, you will follow them because of nostalgia or because of your parents said you cannot say yet you will do it. But you don't really can feel convinced, genuinely the youth are not convinced that there is really use of it, use for it. On the other hand, there are people who will ditch it, abandon it, and they'll go and become big shots in the modern sense and not have anything to do with our tradition. So this integration of these two is what we is is the challenge that we need. You know, when you evaluate your performance in cricket. You don't say that we are like this, we are like this, our way is like this. Either you may think I am no good, but according to me, I am good. The point is there is an objective measurement. If you are out of zero, then you are out of zero. You can't say that our way is like this. You can't say that there is a certain standard of expectation and you are judged according to that. If you are an investment manager, managing people's investments, uh, you can't lose money and say, yeah, well, yeah, this is our way, sir. We, we, for 100 years, we've been doing like this only now. So don't tell us because this is, we don't care. This is the way we do it. Our way doesn't matter. The point is, are you successful in the objective criteria? The objective criteria according to which you're going to be evaluated. Now, politics is objectively evaluated because it depends on whether you win or lose elections. You can't say, yeah, I'm not going to win the election, but you know, according to us, we are very good, you know, we are very good, this is our ideology, we are following our ideology for 100 years, you don't understand, we do it our way. No, because if you are no good, you are, if you lose, you lose, you're out. So, now the question is, I gave you the example, cricket has objective criteria. One team or one player doesn't get to choose for himself, you know, what I consider to be good batting. The field, the, the sport has decided what constitutes good score, bad score. Investment is managed based on such criteria. Politics is based on such criteria. Thank you very much for listening and I wanted to leave you with some provocations because I think in the spirit of our, our civilization, we need to provoke our bright young minds and then you have to think, debate, argue, and that is how we come up with solutions together. Namaskar.